Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this episode of the Double Two Podcast. I'm so excited for this guest. Uh, we just came across each other with this project I'm doing for one of my classes. Um, I'll just get ready to introducing him. Um, he's an associate professor of theology at Cedarville School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Before joining the school, he worked in pastoral ministries for over eight years. Additionally, he's a member at uh, University Baptist Church here uh, near Cedarville. Um, recently, he has developed a passion for promoting and facilitating church planting and currently serves as a director of the Synergy Initiative. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Jeremy Kimball. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, Will. Glad to be here, man. Yeah, I uh, came across to you. Obviously, I've seen you at chapel um, and just in, with, at the Bible school, but um, through my creative problem solving class, um, we had this project about helping the Synergy Initiative, mm-hmm. which is promoting church planning and stuff at Cedarville. And so I kind of want to get started a little bit before all of Cedarville Synergy Initiative, and just what got you into pastoral ministry and made you go that route, um, like into college. And okay, that. yeah. Well, I'll try to make a long story shorter yeah. than, than it could be, but I, from middle school onward, mm-hmm. uh, had the desire and the passion and the vision to be a phys ed teacher and coach. Oh wow, okay. That was my my intention from like middle school onwards. Mm-hmm. So I intended to go to school and do that. I loved sports probably too much in high school. I played three sports and I knew I was not good to, to play professionally any of them, but I thought I could teach them and coach them. And so I had an intention to go to a, a different school altogether than I actually went to and um, I was going to say phys ed and minor in coaching in Spanish, I think as well. And I worked at a Christian summer camp the summer after my high school senior year as a lifeguard. And through a series of events and circumstances, God brought about some people in my life in that that camp that summer, some coworkers, but also uh, some teams and some speakers that just shifted my heart away from the idolatry that I had at that time of sports and of pleasing self toward God and the Bible and God-centeredness. And I I shifted my college choice at that point and decided to go to a small Bible college and uh, do my studies there, which was an an amazingly good choice for me personally. So I had a chance to go to this small college in Pennsylvania and I, I still came in as a phys ed major. So I still came in saying, that's what I'm going to do. And, and a year in, after, you know, kind of like here, five days of chapel a week, Bible classes, all these things, God was, was working in my heart to say, man, I, I love the Bible. I love God. I'd love to convey these things. And honestly, well, it's interesting. Uh, my dad often said to me in my high school years, you're going to be a pastor someday. Yeah. To which I would say to him, like, well, the problem, dad, with that is pastors are public speakers. And there's nothing more terrifying to me than public speaking in high school. I had a few opportunities and they were all terrible. <laughs> so I thought that that's part of the deal. And it was interesting how in college, my second semester, God just was working in my own life in profound ways spiritually. I took a speech class spring semester and it actually went okay. okay. And, I, and I, I, I think that coincides with what God is doing in me internally. But then get to the punchline here. I stayed for a May term after freshman year at college a two week intensive sort of course. And there was nothing to do. There were no cell phones. There were no TVs in this campus. There were computers, but didn't like the internet was just coming into the four. So there's not much to do at all. So the first night that I was there, I got there in the evening and said, well, what should I do? So I decided not sure why I had the spirit prompted this in my, my heart. I decided to read first Timothy, second Timothy and Titus just all the way through why I can't tell you. So yeah. That'd be a good idea. The second night, same scenario, pretty boring, not much going on on campus. I did the same thing. So for 10 straight days, 11 straight days, I just read those books over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. By the end of those days, uh, I, I sensed 1 Timothy 3.1 happening, an aspiration to the office of pastor, elder, overseer. So by the end of that week, I came home to my parents. They were excited. They were thrilled. They said, let's talk to our pastor. That pastor gave me opportunities to teach and to preach at our church back home, and I changed the ma- major, and the rest is history. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. The, uh, I've seen it with some of my friends, just finding their journey of what they actually want. Like, 
I think it's the beauty of gen eds a little bit, even mm-hmm. though they can seem annoying as classes. Sure, it's like, sure. Oh, I don't want to take gen eds. Um, it gives you the opportunity to figure out kind of what you want for your first year before you kind of transition into where yeah. you might actually be going. Well, what, what you want, I think, also just expose you to what you're actually good at. Yeah. And how you can be fruitful for the good of others. Mm. Sometimes we just don't know. The high school years are so constricted in terms of you will take these courses in this scope and sequence, and that's that. It's very generic. Yeah. And college is a chance to to dip into other areas to say, I didn't know I enjoyed that. I didn't know that I could benefit people by means of that. I didn't know there were jobs to be had in that area. Yeah. So those are all discoveries to help, I think. Yeah. Wow. That's a that's a very awesome story. Um, so your college experience after that, so you transitioned into pastoral ministries, was that kind of that was specific major. That's correct. major? Yep. Um, what was your experience with that? And then what led you into the higher education afterwards? Okay. Again, long story, make yeah. it short there. So the, the college went to was fantastic. Tons okay. of Bible, mm-hmm. good preaching, learned a ton. So I, I met my wife there. Mm-hmm. It, it was a great place for friendships, growth, all those things. I thank God for that. So after we left there in 02, we, we got married, mm-hmm. and I then was in a few different church ministries over the course of those eight years. So I yeah. had a chance to serve as a, a student pastor for a time, which was a joy. Uh, the student ministry went well overall. The church um, was going through a lot of transitional issues yep. and a lot of things there to work through. So it's doing well today, by God's grace, which is great. Uh, I then, I, I really wanted to be a lead pastor. I thought I want to do this thing and I want to be able to go and, and mm-hmm. do this well. And so I was 25. There are not many churches banging on the door of 25 year olds saying, please come be our lead pastor. Yeah. So I came across an opportunity in, in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, Osceola, Wisconsin, name of this, this town near the Minnesota border and basically a church plant essentially. Mm-hmm. And went there and just had a, a few years of tremendous, fun, awesome ministry, great people mm-hmm. there, Love them. They're still going strong by God's grace. There's a great pastor doing work there. I'm so thankful for that. And just to, to be honest, I, I also served for as an associate pastor in, in Akron, Ohio for a time. In that, that Wisconsin time, I finished my Master of Divinity, so I had that done, and then was contemplating PhD studies. And I was really wrestling with a year, year and a half into pastoral ministry there in Wisconsin, um, do I have what it takes so maybe this will be helpful for some of your viewers. I don't, I don't know, but I'll just share this. I had this fear. So I, I have to wrestle with fear and, and fight fear all the time. And I had this fear that I was just an inadequate leader. I felt like I, I can preach well and teach well and, and disciple well, but I felt like I was lacking as a leader. And I had some elders that were lay elders, but beyond that, it was just like, what's the vision What's the strategy? Where are we going? We don't have a building yet. How, how do you buy a building and, and do all that stuff? How do you build this out in terms of where we are in the town contextually? There are all these questions. And I just had lots of doubts and worries and fears over that. I told my wife, um, I'm afraid like one Sunday I'm going to get up and someone in our church is going to stand up and point at me and say, he's a fraud. We should fire him. And, and Rachel looked at me like, that's crazy. These people love you. You're doing a good job serving them. And I just, I just had this fear. And, and that never came to fruition, obviously. It was a good place. They, we did very well in that way. But I uh, just felt that, that idea of, man, am I called to do this? Or should I teach? Would that be a better route for me overall? And, you know, I'm a bit older now than 25 years old. I've had friends say, hey, I think at your age now would be a different game than uh, back in your 25 years old in terms of leadership. You've learned yeah. a lot since yeah. then, which I, I certainly have. But we decided to go down the road of uh, PhD. Long story there as well, but got that done. Um, and we didn't know. There, there are more PhDs in Bible than there are jobs. That, oh, wow. That's for sure, for sure. So there, there's, there's more PhDs in Bible out there right now than there are jobs to be had. So I told Rachel, like, I'm going to go for this, and I'm a pastor the rest of my days, and I'm okay with that. I think it's, it's, it'd be obedience to God to do this next step. Yeah. There's an opportunity, open a door for us. There it was. So we did that. 
And in 2013, finished up and through a crazy series of circumstances, got a phone call late July from Cedarville and wound up here two weeks prior to the semester starting. Wow. So that was a, a whirlwind of time, but God put us into this teaching ministry. And so um, year 11, just finishing here at Cedarville, mm -hmm. and I want to view what I do here as pastoral. So like my, my church, I want to do that as well, but also, of course, here, I want to help to shepherd students toward gospel ends. Wow. What was, so dealing with like the feeling of fear and inadequacy as a pastor when you were younger, what were some of the main things that helped you overcome that? Was it like the counsel you had around you, the people, or was it certain moments like where God intervened? How did you feel like it all accumulated together to help you overcome that? Yeah, so I would say three things. Uh, God, a counsel around me, and then growth. Mm -hmm. So, I, and actually, I'm doing this study right now again. I've done this before, but again, going to the Bible and seeing how many times does it say, "Fear not," and how many times does it say, "Be strong and courageous." Yeah. So it's it's the most often cited command set of commands in the Bible. Okay. Fear not and be strong and courageous. And almost every time, or many times, I should say. With those commands there, it's often accompanied by a phrase like, for I am with you. And I've had to grow into that, Will. I've had, to, I've had to grow into, like, God actually is with me. He is for me. He won't leave me or forsake me. He wouldn't forsake me in Wisconsin. He won't forsake me here. Wherever I am, he will not forsake me. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. So I had to learn, and I'm still learning, to embrace the fact that Jesus says, I am with you always to the end of the age, as this great commission thing is going on. So that was one piece. A second piece is godly counselors, right? Friends, peers, but also those who are older, wiser, can speak into your life with more uh, weightiness mm -hmm. and are able to just help you understand what's going on in those ways. So I've, I've had those mentors and wise counselors before now. I have them now um, as well. And I have friends around me to encourage and exhort me toward good ends that know me, mm -hmm. right? So I always like to say, find friends who are not impressed by you. Okay. Because some people, if you have a title, a position, some measure of success, you know, yeah, yeah, success, there you go. They want to be around you just because they can benefit. Yeah. But we, we all can experience that yeah. uh, and be on, on either side of that. And I have a lot of friends who are just not impressed by me. They know <laughs> me really well, so well, in fact, they couldn't possibly yeah. be impressed. And we need that. And then I, I am insatiable when it comes to improvement and growth. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly trying to think through, are there books, are there resources, are there videos, are there podcasts, are there conferences? Is there biblical truth that I need to more readily take into my life that will yield better ends of my own growth in godliness and leadership? Yeah, I had a Justin Powell on my podcast a while back. Uh, he's a business leader, has a Huntington billboards, and he talked a little bit about that um, counsel. Like he really emphasized having a good counsel around you. Um, and so his idea, that was almost like a geographical way of setting counsel. He's mm -hmm. like, out in the world, out in business, out in these places where I talk to these people, I'm the CEO of Huntington billboards. But back here at home, I'm Justin. Yep. They've known me since I was a kid. They've known all the stupid stuff I've done. And they just know me as Justin, so they keep me accountable. And I think that's, from what I've understood and just from what I've experienced, like being able to find that counsel where it's like actual counsel. Yes. And um, I think even Jordan Peterson talks about people who want you to succeed. Yes. Because jealousy is so easy to just go into anyone's mind, anyone's yep. heart, that having friends that aren't jealous, that want you to succeed – but don't want you to succeed to benefit them. Correct. That's so hard to find, but so amazing. That's well said because people can can delve into these areas for jealousy's <laughs> sake. They can upend a relationship, or to be benefiting themselves can do what they do, and and just to be able to say no, this person genuinely has my good in mind, and good isn't just a pat in the back. Be like you're just a great person. Hey, I have friends who. Will say to me like you're just off in your tone. That wasn't the right response. Yeah. Uh, the way you said that was not helpful. What were you thinking when you when you did that? 
And, and they're saying that in love and they're exhorting me yeah. day after day. So I'm not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin mm -hmm. because it can be easy to, you know, read your own press clippings or just want to believe the best and try to ignore yeah. the bad stuff. And you need people who will say to you, Hey, this is true. My, my, my pastor at UBC is a godly man who loves me as a friend of mine, and he has no problem <laughs> pastoring me. And I, I thank yeah. God for that. Yeah. He has no problem pastoring me, and he has no prob problem coming alongside of me and saying, brother, like, I love you, and I want to encourage you in this, and at times I want to admonish you and, and rebuke you, correct you in times yeah. of this. Man, it's, it's a game changer. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, let's, I kind of want to transition a little bit to how I came to know you a little bit more. Uh, with the Synergy Initiative. So we talked about it a little bit, uh, I think it was two weeks ago at this mm -hmm. point. Um, how did the Synergy Initiative, this movement for house planting or church planting at Cedarville come about and become what it is now today? Yeah, it's, it's only just over a year old. Mm -hmm. People talk about Synergy as though, oh, it's been around for a long time. Like, <laughs> it hasn't. And we're still building out all that it could be, yeah. I think, as time goes on. But it really came about by means of the summer of 2022, I had a chance to go back to New York where I'm from mm -hmm. and uh, preach at my home church I grew up in and also the camp that I grew up going to and worked at a couple of years as well. And the church is stable. There's, there's good going on there overall. There, there's good... Um, in terms of New York, they're a good-sized church. They're like just over 200 people, which in New York, in a rural area, that's a big church. So they're doing well overall, but they, they're, they're pretty plateaued. They're there in that way. And, and then the camp um, had, had really reduced in size. The week that I went to, I thought, man, when I was here years ago, it was a much larger group of students that were here. And talked to the pastors at the church and the director of the camp, and then we drove back through New York and the southern tier of New York, back to Ohio, and just looking around the area and saying, man, this is such a needy area, New York. I never wanted to go back to New York, just candidly, but I know it's a very gospel needy area. Uh, then later on in the summer, we had a chance to go to Michigan. So my kids do what's called cousin camp with their, their grandparents. And Rachel and I went to um, Holland for a few days for some time away. And came back through, met with a pastor friend of mine, and had a great conversation with him. Um, and then we came back to stay with Rachel's sister, and they're right by um, a large university in Michigan, to say that. And uh, they said, hey, do you want to walk around campus for a while and see the campus? I said, sure, that's great. So we went to this campus and walked around for a bit, and man, Will, it, it was just oppressively dark spiritually. Yeah. Walking around and saying, man, there's just terrible graffiti and drugs and alcohol and just open sin, just there, flaunting. And I was just discouraged. And, and we turned a corner at one point and we, we saw a few students in a quad area sitting down in the grass, Bibles open. Four students. And there's more than four Christian students this, this year, obviously. There, there's, there's more than that. Yeah. But I just thought about this university has tens of thousands of students on its campus. There's four. There, there's more, but the percentages I know are low yeah. in terms of evangelical Christian there on this campus. So we drove back home the next day, and I just drove home with this, this phrase in my mind of, that can't be. Yeah. I, New York... This Michigan thing I just saw, like, we, there's lostness. And everyone knows that as a Christian, but it just struck me anew to say, well, what can we do? So thankfully, we have an amazing president here that I talked to not long after we had a meeting. I said, I'm just burdened for our students to, like, graduate and be on mission. There's, there's 50,000 students at that university up there, and there's 1,000 graduating here per year. Not great odds, but, man, if there are 1,000 students that are getting after it, on mission, ready to go, that could be a game changer. Yeah. And he said, well, what do you want to do? To which I said, I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> so we yeah. talked for a while about what could be. And, and what came of this was the Synergy Initiative, um, you know, mobilizing trained disciples to multiply healthy churches together. And, and the key word of synergy corresponding to together, that's the idea we want to say to students, what if two or three or five or ten of you or more of you 
decided to go from here when you graduate to a place, yeah. get in a church, strengthen that church, or help that church plant a church, or whatever else, um, and see that as a, a vision embraced mm-hmm. by the majority of our students here. I believe if God would so will that to be the case and this continued on for some decades, that would be a game changer overall in yeah. our country and world. Yeah, I've seen uh, even some of the changes that people have made at Ohio State or some of the universities around here. Right. Um, some of the guys I know, they've been almost every weekend, like Saturday night or Sunday evening, they'll go out to the schools and even just host like these like board game or hmm. yard game uh, events with the local whatever uh, Christian organization that is there. It's awesome. Because uh, that was a part of my – my campaign uh, for a sophomore vice president was I want us to learn how to serve others. And that doesn't just mean non-believers, but let's serve the Christians that are at those schools yes. and build them up. Because we have a great bubble here at Cedarville. Uh, like they talked at Aleve uh, the other night. Um, it's an amazing bubble. We're building each other up. We're yep. fairly encouraged because it's just a bunch of believers together. But those it might, might not be the same for those believers. They're kind of fighting every single day. Yep. So if we can bring our encouragement and spill it over to them, yeah. that would be huge on it, campus. It, it's a blessing to be here and get what we get, and we're blessed to be a blessing to others, yeah. right, to, to go and do that. So that's a, that's a great vision. Yeah. So what uh, what are some of the next things you have with Synergy? I know recently you sent out an email, and you're announcing it's – is it Synergy Connect? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So a, a next iteration for Synergy would be – uh, student org mm-hmm. called Synergy Connect. So Mickey Neal, Will Galkin are helping to head that up. Some of those as well coming on board. Um, but these guys have a passion to see, as they say, gospel needy areas get reached with the gospel. Yep. And so we talked about it for a while and just said, well, what if we, the, the scenario could be for four years, some student says, I've got a passion for you know, Boston, Massachusetts, want to go there and do that. And they're, they're in Lawler. And there's some student in the Hill being like, I've got a passion for Boston. And in four years, it's conceivable they would never meet each other. Mm-hmm. And so, which is crazy, but it can happen. And so the point of that org is to say, okay, how can we connect those who have interest in certain cities to say, let's meet up mm-hmm. every other week over dinner or something like that. And let's just talk about the needs that are there, our own desires to find a job there, to work there, to go to a church there, to help out there, to pray for that area. Once in a while to hear from the pastors we work with in that area and hear from them and get a vision for what's going on there as well. And uh, even maybe go on go city trips to those spots and be able to engage in that way as well. Um, So that'll all kick off. We have an event in September, Lord willing, coming up here where we're going to have pastors from all of our ghost cities. So we do ghost city trips, one fall break, a lot of spring break, one in May to Boston, Syracuse, Washington, DC, Pittsburgh, Salt Lake city, and Utah, and and Denver, excuse me. And we go to those six cities right now. We have partnerships there with churches and we do trips there for three reasons. One is to say to students, okay, let's go there and do legitimate work of ministry that would benefit these churches. Yeah. Number two, let's learn from them. What's their philosophy of ministry? How are they doing in this context? Why are they doing it that way? And then third, to say to students after a week of time there, could you see yourself planting your life here for some period of time, maybe even long term? Yeah. That's the reason why we do those trips. Okay. And so we'll have all the Go City pastors, Lord willing, a lot of them from those cities, coming in to the September event, and we will gather in, in BTS 104. And I want to just cast vision for Synergy again and what's going on with this. And then in six different rooms in the BTS, we'll say, hey, if you have Boston interest, go to this room. If you have Salt Lake City interest, go to this room. Pittsburgh, go to this room. And we'll hear from those pastors in those rooms. I hope hundreds of students come out out to this. And just hear, like, what's going on there? What are you doing? We're partnered. What does that look like? What does that mean? And we're going to launch those Synergy Connect groups from that event. So from that event, we'll then say, hey, the next step for you is to put your name in the database right here before you leave the room, uh, and then they'll get with you in contact to say, we're going to start meeting this time, and let's do it. That's the, that's the idea of the org. I think it's a great idea. It's wonderful. Those guys had a great vision for it, and I uh, love that. So that will coincide with – we'll do events in the fall and spring as well, and uh, that I think is the next step to say, 
how do we put some, some glue to, you do an event like, yeah, that's great. What do I do next? Yeah. And this is a way to say, we'll connect this group and we're going to have those six city groups. We're going to have one international as well group to say, if you have interest to go overseas missions, here's a group to meet as well in that. Uh, then to say, we may expand those someday, who knows? But to at least say the glue, the stickiness is joining these people here and think through strategy of finding a job, finding a place, going together, getting with the church, strengthening, multiplying, planting, whatever it is. Wow. Yeah. I know uh, I've had some thoughts about church planting. It's actually been a recent idea of mine. And I think that's important, especially because I almost, a lot of people have their circles and a lot of it's very major specific circles. Mm -hmm. So having the opportunity where you're just bound together by like, okay, I want to go to this place. Yes. Cause I like, you need a combination of a bunch of different people and like Absolutely. ideas. You need a pa someone that probably just wants to be a pastor. Yeah. yeah. Cause um, I think his name was Joel Wayne. He was one of the uh, preachers here mm -hmm. at a chapel and he has like a business, his wife has a business, and they also have a church. Mm -hmm. Not everyone can do that. Right. That's a very difficult and very like small percentage of people that can do both. But there's some people who are amazing at being a pastor and pastoral ministries and amazing at business. And so being able to combine those together, I yes. think that's huge. It is. And, and this is part of my passion for synergy is, what we'll just say, let's say like, you know, five to 10% of our students are majoring in something that would say, I want to do vocational full-time ministry. Yeah. Awesome. Great. We want them to think through planting, replanting missions, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that means 90 to 95% of students on this campus are majoring in something other than I want to do vocational ministry. Yeah. But man, the church, like <laughs> Ephesians four tells us we're to like pastors are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Yeah. So those 90 95% that would go somewhere and do something, I'm like, you're needed ministers in the church, number one. And we need you to just take your Cedarville Bible minor, ministry opportunities that you've learned, experience you've learned from, all these things, and go apply that in local churches yeah. as volunteers, as members, as ministers. Mm -hmm. But then secondly, yeah, business, nursing, education, all these fields that are our mission fields themselves to say, I want to be able to go in these places and be on mission there to draw them in. And to say, if I want to go to Salt Lake City, for example, or, or Boston or Denver, they're expensive places. We want to plant churches. It's going to cost us money. Yeah. And so that being the case, those that do work and have opportunity to be generous with that, uh, that monetary gain are helpful toward the end of gospel multiplication. So work in and of itself is God ordained and good, Yeah. right? It's a mission field. It's a way to be generous. It's a way to help to uh, funnel and fuel and fund the Great Commission. So yeah. all of those play in to say every student on this campus has a role to play in the Great Commission. Yeah. Yeah. There's many gifts that everyone's been given, many spots they've been put in, whether it's you're making a fair amount of money mm -hmm. or you're serving a specific group of people, all of that contributes, especially... Um, like the idea of entrepreneurship, um, something we've talked about, Dr. Kerry Oberbunner um, is the very chair of it here. Yeah. And I think entrepreneurship is a huge part of church planting. It's like the idea of like you have your stable church, but now you're going out and making this new idea and this new place and trying to build this thing almost from nothing. Yep. Uh, one definition I really like of entrepreneurship is there's a need, then a business person decides, I want to serve that need and then make a little bit of money from it. Right. And so I think uh, combining the idea of entrepreneurship and also intrapreneurship, which is like um, within an organization, kind of like the Synergy Initiative, I'd call that intrapreneurship okay. you're within Cedarville, but you're making programs and ideas within the main organization like of Cedarville, like which is that. something good. that I think a lot of people don't realize is if you are a leader within an organization, you are an entrepreneur, hmm. a.k.a. an entrepreneur. Like hmm. nurses who are leaders within the ER yep. realm or um, maternity or any realm of it, if you're like helping people, leading, or maybe starting something that's for good, yep. you're an entrepreneur. Constant problem solving. Yes. Right, communication toward better ends. Yes. Oh, that's helpful. That's helpful. By the way, quick, quick caveat. Uh, a shout out to Dr. Oberbrunner. 
I just want to say thank you. So I, I went to Salt Lake City with the team over spring break. We lead the Salt Lake City Go Trip. And it's phenomenal. It's 30 students there mm -hmm. and, and realized this is an expensive place to live. Yeah. Plenty of church here. Wow. And, and there, to get to 1% of the population of Utah as being conservative evangelical, by 2040, to get to 1%, they're estimating they need to plant 305 churches. And the cost of that is staggering. So yeah. I emailed he and Dr. Heyman while in Utah, and I was like, hey, I want to talk to you guys about this because it's a pinch point. Yeah. And I, I don't know, but you guys know. And that was where I met with Dr. Bruner and had a chance to get some ideas from him, number one. Two, do a podcast with him. And third, he said, hey, do you want to come to the creative problem-solving class and pitch this? Yeah. And, and now there are groups doing that, mm -hmm. which I'm sitting in on Wednesday to hear these presentations. Yeah. And I will benefit from ideas that will come from that, I'm sure. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, our team has been working on it. It's very exciting. Um, I hopefully it's like... Um, there's pieces of our presentation that can fit into whatever actually ends up happening. Yeah. Because there's a lot, there's a lot of areas of this idea that come to it, so it's hard to do it all. Yeah, yeah. Which we'll keep talking though, because little pieces along the way come together. It's people. good. Yeah, many different groups working on the same idea. I think is huge. Yep. Um, so, kind of going back to entrepreneurship and leadership, um, what do you think the importance is um, when it comes to business people getting involved with church planting and ministry because i think this is something that a lot of people struggle with specifically mm. like christians promoting is they always talk about do ministry outside of your work do ministry like uh read your bible like in your own separate time which is good but it's mm -hmm. like yeah they almost don't push integrating your faith into your work and like i don't think that's pushed enough um what do you say how can we promote that better into showing everyone, no matter what you are doing, that is your ministry? Yeah. If I'm hearing your question correctly, I would say, actually, this is part of my summer work for myself. I'm always trying to think through summer internal projects for me to better myself in. Yeah. And, and one is, I think we have a very thin theology of work. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as Protestants, as evangelicals, we have, we have a heritage that's a thicker, more robust theology of work. And we've had some books like Tim Keller's book, Dan Doriani has got a book on this as well. Uh, Greg Gilbert has had one. There, there's a few resources out there, but I think overall, we tend to think of work as share the gospel at work and get the work done. But as soon as you get done, like come do ministry in the church. And again, those are amazingly good things. Let's not like say either or here. Yeah. Yes and amen to those things. Absolutely yes. Yes. And I want to say to a brother, a sister, laboring in business. Right. In my church, we have uh, some guys, like literally some brothers, who began a CrossFit gym. And they're doing that work. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to say that work that you're doing in and of itself done with excellence is glorifying to God. Yeah. Like God said in Genesis 1, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over it. And there are a variety of ways to have dominion over the earth. And now that it's fallen, there's more work to be done in that regard. And so I would say to somebody, man, if you're, if you're in business, for example, and you are, are doing a work there and you are providing some service to people in that way, do it well. Do it with excellence. Do it out of love, like neighbor love, to say, I want to provide a service to benefit you. Uh, James 5, treat your employees well. That, that's biblical. And, and all those things are in and of themselves glorifying to God. God is pleased with good work being done. Yeah. So I think that the problem is trying to hold those things at times because I think people tilt to say, I feel guilty doing my business. I should be in church ministering, volunteering, or at home. Or I made too much money. That's probably a bad thing. Well, first of these six tells us not, not to make no... It doesn't say make no money. Yeah. It says be generous. Yeah. Like earn rewards in heaven, like garner up those rewards in heaven by means of generosity toward others, toward God-centered ends, and don't be selfish and greedy, yeah. right? So one, I can feel guilty about that. And the other side is like, I'm, I'm all in my business. I'm going in, and, and now we neglect like Sundays. We neglect time in the Word. We neglect family. Yeah. Th those are bad ends. Mm -hmm. There is a way to do your work that is 
work being done that glorifies God yeah. and contributes to the church, to family, to those things that are important as well. And I would think we need to do a better job of just embracing the fact that God made us to work. It's not a yeah. fallen thing. Work is fallen at some level, obviously, but work in and of itself is a good and to embrace that as we should alongside of the callings of family, mm-hmm. church, et cetera. Yeah, some of my, my, my business professors talk about money specifically because it can often be a very, like, demonized thing, mm-hmm. which the love of money is the sin. It's yes. not because that's making an idol of money, but actually just making it, I wouldn't say, is the sin. It's the love of it and trying to, like, get it and have so much of it. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Joe Abraham, he talked about this on a podcast. He said, there just aren't enough Christian billionaires. And he says this in a way of like Christian billionaires, if there's a bunch of them like going for investing, like if there's a Christian startup and they want Christian investors, their pool of people is like all the way Mm. brought down. Mm. And so he's Mm. like Mm. having people where their ministry is just having a lot of money that they're able to give to people is needed. And mm. huge. Like Hobby Lobby, um, from what I understand what he said, is they get like $2 billion in like profit, and they split that in half, and half of it goes to Christian organizations. Startups, those sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, startups. Gotcha. So imagine you had a, many more Christian billionaires or quote-unquote very rich Christians that were able to do that. That would be huge mm-hmm. for stuff like trying to facilitate housing over out in Utah with the mm-hmm. high prices. So I think that's the conversation that a lot of people have where it's like, oh, you don't want to make too much money, stuff like that. Just if you make it, just be generous with it and don't yeah. put that, your faith in it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. It's, it's, and it's important. First Timothy 6 is such an important chapter to study on this. Mm-hmm. I'd encourage any viewers thinking about money and the use of it to the glory of God to study First Timothy six, yeah. And I would say billionaires, sure, great, wonderful. It's a good thing, and would, wouldn't oppose that. I would want to say as well, just knowing stats as I do, to regular church members, if we all just gave, yeah, at a level of ten percent, ministries and startups that are Christian could be easily funded. Yeah. So I would say yes, to what you're saying there. I'd also say church members, be church members, yeah, and give like yeah. you're supposed to. But I just. Uh, Three weeks ago, I think, Will had a had lunch with um, a good, godly Christian couple uh, down in Florida. Wonderful people, uh, very successful in business, uh, and highly generous. Yeah. Man, just very generous to particular Christian causes, and they've benefited uh, just the world in a certain way as well as Christianity's flourishing in a certain way yeah. because they've said, we, we have this, we have a stewardship then, let's steward it well. And I believe they have. And, and those people that have that blessing there, we'd say, hey, like, look to steward that well mm-hmm. and, and not seek to um, get more for yourself. That's the temptation. It's, 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 the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But man, it's an easy temptation to get that. And either if you're a saver, just a little more, or if you're a spender, being like, man, like that upgrading the car, upgrading the house, upgrading this, that, and the other. Yeah. Is that necessary? Or is there a way to live at your lifestyle um, point at this salary and then say as it increases, just say I'm here and give the rest of this stuff away? Yeah. I, Hobby Lobby does. It's a good example. Yeah. Well, kind of to wrap up here, what is one thing um, with the Synergy Initiative and Synergy Connect that students can do? and people at Cedarville can do uh, to get involved or to understand more about the mission? Yeah, so I mean, you can look at cedarvilleedu slash synergy. Mm-hmm. That's our website. You can see more details there about the vision, mission. Uh, we're posting videos there little by little to um, let people know more about what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm filming presently 20-some-odd uh, videos, just like short training videos mm-hmm. that students and others can watch down the road here next year probably, uh, just about, how do I move from just my own personal disciplines to being on a core team helping the church plant? Yeah. It's trying yeah. to move. How would you think about those things overall? So that we'll produce those and get those done, Lord willing, here in the next several months. I'd say to students, they'll look at the website. Uh, when there are emails or videos put out about events coming up, come to the event and yeah. hear about what's going on. We have outside speakers. I do some speaking to those as well. And would just say, hear about what's going on in the world. Come in September, hear from these Go City pastors, and hear about what's going on in various places. Join a connect group, mm-hmm. and uh, let's just let's just flood 
that org with lots of names saying, you know what, I'm not quite sure yet, but I think I want to just join in to see, you know, the heart behind this city and see what's going on. I'm not sure where I'll land exactly, but this would be good to know about. Because if we just get a heart for church multiplication and disciple making, wherever you go, it's going to be useful. Yeah. So we're just trying to, with the website, with the events, with the groups, Right now, like those are our ways we're trying to help students to say, I want to have a mindset that says, no matter what my major is and what I'm going into, I have a chance to do good work before God, make disciples, and help churches get planted. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and for coming on. Um, I was excited to have this conversation. I yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, man. Fruitful and helpful for all the students and people who hear it. Um, Everyone, thank you for listening. If you made it this far, um, go check out the Synergy Initiative on Cedarville's website and just look out for the emails regarding Synergy Connect. Uh, thank you guys for watching. This is the Douglas 2 Podcast. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. Cool, man. There we go.